And it's now time for VoiceOver Body Shop, and it's our special stay-at-home, haven't-shaved-in-a-while version. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to look very old, and the missus is like, you know, that makes you look really old. Uh, but anyway, our guest tonight is Carolyn Casey, and she is a commercial producer. Wave and say hi, Carolyn. Hi. There we go. That makes it easy. Hello. <laughs> we're, we're, she is a commercial producer. We're going to talk about what goes on on the other side of the glass and how, how commercials come together. Should be fascinating. We'd love your questions, and you can jump them and dump them right into our Facebook chat room. And uh, Jeff Holman's on chat duty tonight, and we'll get those questions. We'll ask them a little later. Anything else we need to add, George? Uh, let's get this show on the road. Let's light this candle like SpaceX. Voice over body shop right now. From the outer reaches, they came. Bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Whittem, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week they allow you into their world, bringing you talks with the biggest names in the voiceover world today, letting you ask your questions and giving you the latest information to make the most of your voiceover business. Welcome to voiceover body shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters, and VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Good evening. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO. Yes. All right. Well, <laughs> my goodness, we've been home for a long time and we've been doing this show virtually for some time now. You know, I miss the coffee. I miss the camaraderie. I miss the hugs. But we're, we're trying the best we can. And uh, I, I take it things are nice and quiet where you are, though, Jordan. They were. There was a helicopter circling for quite uh, an inordinate amount of time this morning. Sheriff's helicopter, apparently. We have no idea why. But other than that, it's been pretty quiet up here in Topanga. It's a good place to hole up in the current, with the current affairs going on right now. Yeah. So anyway, well, you know, the other day, you, you know, I was last week, you said, hey, I had this great conversation with this wonderful lady named Carolyn Casey, who's a commercial producer. Let's get her on the show. So, okay. We're all wondering what goes on on the other side of the glass. There's so much... You know, because everybody has to be in a home studio now, there's a lot of issues around there. So we thought Carolyn might make a great guest. And we asked and her and she goes, what? she decided to show up, which is she really good. Yes. Carolyn, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dan. Thank great. you, George. It's great to have you here. Uh, Thank you. Now, you're, you're a commercial producer and a voice actor and not an attorney, though. Uh, but we're not yet. Not yet. OK, you're working on that. My mom would love that, though. Yeah. My mom wanted me to be a proctologist, but that's a whole, that's a whole nother story. And Wow, that there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. There, there is, there is. So where are you from originally? I grew up in Jersey. Jersey? Which exit? Uh, 9A. Okay. <laughs> Mid-state. Yeah. So tell, yeah, tell us a little bit how about how you got into what you're doing, which is apparently very multifaceted. Um. Well, I'll, I guess I'll start with the producing side. I really got pulled onto the agency side from just, it, it's, it's a story probably unlike most stories you hear now with 
the current generation of producers who all have gone to film school, et cetera. I didn't, um, I was a print journalism major and quite literally was working with a guy who was a creative director. I was working in a different role and he said, you know, you'd make a great producer. Why don't you come work for me as soon as I get an account big enough to fund it? And I was like, what does a producer do? <laughs> no, no idea. Um, I, was, I was loading film for a commercial photographer, you know, to get a little bit more experience with photography. And um, so that was, a, that was a long time ago. And I've stayed on the agency side. A lot of people ask me, you know, if I work in film and documentaries, although I wish I did work in documentaries, but I work on the commercial side and very specifically, I'm an agency producer, which is how I also got pulled into voiceover. Um, as many of us know, you end up reading on scratch tracks when you're sitting in an edit bay or you work at an agency and they need someone who sounds, you know, mature um, and, you know, or conversational next door, whatever it is. So I ended up, um, you know, getting recruited to do a lot of things like case studies and new business pitches, client presentations scratch tracks on um, commercial spots. And then people were encouraging me saying, you really should pursue this on the side. So here I am. And, and I, we're glad you I were, carry on. Thank you. I don't know that I'd call myself a voiceover actor or artist, but I, I dabble, so. Okay, well, that, that's good enough. But at least, you know, you get to experience the side that we get to see, which is I do. getting in front of the microphone and, you know, learning that it's a one-to-one -one conversation with people, not to an entire crowd, which is not easy, easy to do. So, all right. So you, so you're the person, you're the, one of the people that coordinates all the stuff that needs to get done. So an advertising agency can complete a commercial for a campaign. And right. I, I bet that's an awful lot of stuff. What are some of the details you have to deal with? You know, the way I explain it to people outside of our business, and I know that everyone who's watching is pretty much in this business. But the way I explain it to people outside is I work like a general contractor if you're building a home. You know, I manage the schedule and the budget and I try to surround myself by the best people we can afford. So uh, sometimes I make creative recommendations, like I'll look at a script. Part of my job, or I guess the crux of my job is to take the script and get it on air or live digital or in theaters or wherever it's going. So to get the final files out and delivered and everything in between. So I manage the creative team. I make recommendations creatively might be about, these are the directors I think might be best for this. I, I shortlist a bunch of directors, same with animators, music composers, editors, visual effects artists, all of those things. I'm supposed to have a really good working knowledge of all of those things so that I can make recommendations to the team. And then everything in between in terms of schedule and budget is my responsibility as well. So, you know, sometimes people will come to me and say, oh, you should hire my makeup artist friend. Well, yes, ultimately that person works for us, but I don't hire the makeup artist. I hire the people who hire the people who hire the makeup artist. <laughs> okay. Now it all makes sense. Crystal clear. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's how anything gets done. You need a new bathroom. It's like, okay, I hire the tile guy. I hire this person. Yeah. I... Right. Okay. That makes it sense. works like a like a contractor does. It really does in so many ways. It's, it's interesting. But you work. Are you on contract with an agency or are different agencies? Are you a freelancer well, in that? I have done both. Most of my career, I've been um, freelance, and I currently am. But I've also held staff jobs. I've been a you know everything from a very junior coordinator all the way to an executive producer. I do really enjoy freelance and. Um, I'm comfortable in it. It's not for everybody, but I like it. Yeah. Well, voiceover is a very freelance business. So I think most of us yeah. probably understand exactly what you're talking about. So I, I know it's probably a little different every time because every client is different and every script is different. But generally, what's the production process like, you know, from advertisers saying, we need these commercials to, to getting it out? Yeah. Wow. It does vary. I mean, the general timeline, depending on, you know, where you're working, what you're doing, what the media, you know, is that you're buying. Um, I, I work primarily in television production. I don't really do, well, I say television, I should say 
video production. I don't really do much radio anymore. Um, when you're starting out, they give you a lot of radio stuff. So it, it really depends. If you're freelance, you don't usually get as much lead time on a project. So you're brought in once the script is approved by the client, and then you, you're supposed to bid it out. And the traditional way is that we bid at least three production companies, sometimes more. Um, that's a more extensive process that I don't want to totally bore people with, and it would take the whole the whole hour. Um, <laughs> But again, make creative recommendations and then bid sort of all the different pieces. So there's the production piece, there might be visual effects piece, editorial, post, music, estimating talent, um, voiceover, all of those things. Put a budget together, get it signed off by the client. I'm encapsulating what could be weeks or days or yeah. whatever. Get it signed off by the client and then go and hire all the appropriate people and then you're you know, you're kind of, you're managing a, a team and then you're taking it most of the time as a producer uh, in the role that, that I play. Most of the time you are taking, you know, you're doing the pre-production portion, production, edit, post-production, delivery, um, which is what I'm doing right now. I was delivering some spots today that were staggered delivery over the past couple of weeks. Mm. So it's, it, it actually is like juggling knives is that picture we found of you. <laughs> yeah. Feels like it most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. What's the shortest timeline you've had to run up against and what, you know, what are the scenarios where they become, you know, uncomfortably short? Yeah, it's a great question, George. I mean, with the advent of digital media, timelines have become so incredibly compressed in ways that we really never thought possible. I recently had a job that I, uh, I started on. I was hired um, like November 20th. We, uh, you know, with Thanksgiving included, we had to bid the job, prep it, shoot it, cut it, do the post, deliver it. We were on air with three spots December 9th. And, you know, the normal timeline, timeline with that might have been, you know, two, three months at least. But things are very compressed. Um, these were actually on air. But um, it was a broadcast. But I think with the advent of Carolyn, media, yeah, the lav mic just started touching the collar. Sorry about that. That's okay. It... Um, there you go. That. So Perfect. the um, you know the timelines have just become very compressed with digital media. Uh, a lot of it is just sort of the climate, you know, and uh, with brands and they want to be able to pivot quickly and want to be able to react quickly depending on the brand. But we're seeing what I think are much tighter timelines, which is why as it relates to your audience on the voiceover side, um, you know, you often get scripts, I think more often than not now that say we need this back in the next two, three hours, right? Hmm. Or tomorrow versus you've got a couple days to work on something. And that, that just kind of trickles down from what the kind of, you know, economic climate looks like, what individual brand climates lo look like, how quickly, um, you know, social media forces brands to react. Let's just say Popeye's chicken is doing something on social media like they have recently and suddenly, <laughs> cute, um, suddenly Burger King needs to react quickly, you know? So it, it really just depends. It's, it's, um, it's often a, you know, we, we know it's often a reaction. It's we a have to react. We a, have to react quickly. It's a tactical thing then by, by different advertisers. Yes. Okay. So, you know, when, when I'm sitting around at my desk and, and watching my email come in and auditions and stuff like that, one of the things we get is an audition and it's, and it comes, you know, you've, you've done all your work and, and it's like, okay, now let's hire the voice talent and we've got the script and the script writer is like, okay, here's the script. Here's what we want. And they give you the specs. Right. And I, and I have, you know, our, our friend Mark Cashman does this routine called we're looking for a moose. Uh, and uh, they spell it wrong. And so everybody would like give him the worst specs they could find uh, where someone would go on for a paragraph and a half and then the script is starts Friday, uh, you know, <laughs> something along those lines. But yeah, where where 
how are specs determined and by whom? And is there flexibility in that? Or what really happens with that? Where does that come from? Yeah, it's a really good question. It varies with the account, with the agency, and even within a brand group inside an agency. So it, there, there isn't sort of one way. Typically, the copywriter is responsible for the specs. Very often, the client uh, asks for approval of those specs. Um, you know, sometimes the specs get to the voiceover talent and ultimately, you know, sometimes, ultimately they're really not what the client might have expected. So it may be, you know, we want someone who sounds 25 to 30, not like an announcer at all, very kind of unpolished girl next door, whatever. And then the client hears the reads and says, well, these people don't sound like professional announcers at all. We want someone who sounds 50 and sophisticated and like she might be your trustworthy aunt or, you know. So it just, it really depends. But, but in general, the copywriter is responsible for writing the specs. They go through the producer, um, often to the account team and then to the client and the client will agree, yes, 25 to 30, girl next door, whatever, whatever. Right. If you're just joining us, our guest is Carolyn Casey. She is a commercial producer. She produces video and all the stuff that goes with it. And she's one of the people that, you know, that helps us get hired. If you've got a question for her about this process or really what happens to our auditions or anything like that, throw them in the Facebook chat room right now. Jeff Holman is sitting there patiently waiting for you to ask your questions because this is an interactive show and we want to make sure you get the chance to ask the questions. Although I've thought up just about everything we could possibly ask. No, there's probably a whole lot more about that. So let's really get into it, Carolyn, about how are spots cast? I mean, I get an audition. I do a couple of reads. I shove it down this magic portal and poof, it's gone. And we never hear again, unless we get hired. What, what goes right. on once at the other end of that portal where you're waiting for it to, it's, boom, oh, we got all these yeah. auditions, boom. Now what do we do? And specifically as it relates to voiceover casting, right? Versus on camera it, casting. Ex absolutely. Yeah. I know that's the subject of your show. I just wanted to, I just wanted to clarify for the audience that, that I'm speaking about voiceover casting. So, um, I, I, Dan, you and I were talking the other day about in the old days, back when I was a cubby producer, um, the, the way that it worked was so much more, uh, it was so much smaller. It, and I don't want to say more streamlined, but it was small. I remember the days when I could name a lot of the LA voiceover talent who worked all the time. You would get, uh, in the early days, you would get quite literally a tape cassette with maybe 20 to 25 recommendations from your casting director on it. And all that has changed. And it has changed, especially with the advent of digital media. So there are a few ways it works now uh, when we're casting voiceover. It depends on the project. It depends on the budget. It depends on the timeline. A lot of the time, I will reach out to trusted talent agents, limited handful of people, depending on if it's union, non-union, but limited handful of people. Uh, agents now have the ability to just send, you know, email out to people, do a blast and say, hey, we need this uploaded in two hours. You know, we need it sent to us versus the old days when voiceover talent had to go into a talent agent's, you know, actual office and read with their booth manager or whatever. So, Agency producers like me can go directly to trusted agents. If we have the time and the money, we most often, at least I personally love to go to a trusted casting director. They just make our lives so much easier. They do all the dirty work. They pull in all of the voiceovers from agents. They reach out to their trusted agents and they pull in you know, endless voiceovers. They pull them down. It's not uncommon for a casting director to get upwards of a thousand reads sometimes and then call that down to 25. It, it sounds crazy, but that happens. Um, 
And then there are obviously all of the sort of online resources, uh, uh, voicebank.net. It used to be, it's now voices.com, right? Mm. And, um, you know, I know there, there, there are various ways to do that. On the a- agency projects that I typically work on, they're usually larger national brand pro- projects. We either work with a casting director or uh, I'll go straight to agents I trust because honestly, going just sort of uploading something and then not knowing what I'm going to get and having to sift through 500 or 1,000 submissions is just, um, it's untenable. Uh, but what what usually happens from there is, again, it depends on my relationship with a copywriter, or any producer's relationship with the group. But uh, either one or two things, uh, one of two things happens. Either I forward all those auditions to my creative team and the copywriter and sometimes the art director go through them. And then once they create a short list, it might go up through several rungs of people. It might go to an associate creative director, a creative director, an executive creative director, maybe even the chief creative officer and the account team before it even goes to the clients. And then it might, you know, there might be several layers of the client. Right. So there's quite a succession of people who have to approve it. Um, How many auditions actually get listened to though? Well, yeah, that's the burning question. If if a ca- if I'm working with a casting director who's really done his or her, her homework and has culled through the auditions and sent me 25 or 50, that's easy to go through, right? If I post something, I mean, I remember a fairly recent job where we got 500 submissions and my copywriter went through every one of them. But the tr- the dirty little secret is that Agencies are off and brands who have their own staffs, their own copywriters, their own producers are often these days running so lean that writers and producers and art directors and creative directors have so much on their plates that it's virtually impossible to get through 500 auditions. And the truth is that they could listen to 100 or 200 and they hear a handful of people they like, they may stop there. We try not to do that. We try to make it fair to all the talent and not ask for 500 submissions. It's best if we as producers can, regardless of how we reach out, say, hey, can you send me your 10 best people? And then if you've reached out to you know, five or 10 agents, at least you have a manageable list of people because it's just not fair to let a voiceover talent submit something that might never be heard. Right. I would say, unless unless you're submitting to somewhere where you know there are just hundreds of people also submitting, you know, say just a, an online submission, I think your your audition is going to be heard. I think that there is just truth to the fact that sometimes if you're submitting along with everybody else and the mother, your audition may not be heard, but simply because of the sheer volume. Yeah, it's probably quite a few. So it seems like there's a lot of people involved in this process. We don't realize that. It's like, well, one person's there hearing are. it and they're throwing it to somebody else. But yep. ult- ultimately, as I think you mentioned a little earlier, doesn't it really come down to the client saying, okay, I approve this person or no, my brother-in-law would sound much better doing this. <laughs> I, yes, I, I can <laughs> honestly say I've never had the client's brother-in-law. Oh, because, good. Glad to hear. Um, yeah, I've never had that happen. I, I hear what you're saying. Yes, ultimately it comes down to the client's final decision. I have had clients say, hey, I respect your opinions and I really trust you guys. And this is why we hire you. And and we're going to go with your recommendation. I've had that happen many times. Um, but ultimately, the client is really not going to listen to the 100 auditions we did, typically. They're going to listen to the short list we brought them. And depending on what the project is, that might be on average three, five, ten 10 people, usually not more than that. So the list is, you know, very distilled by the time it gets to the client, usually. Wow. All right. Once again, no client, no client has the time to go through a hundred auditions. I wouldn't think so. You would hope anyway. 
Uh, they're busy, you know, milking cows and making candy and all those other things. Uh, what's milking cows. Hey, somebody's got to do it. All right. So our, once again, our guest is Carolyn Casey. She is a commercial producer. and We're talking about what goes on in the production process. Again, if you've got a question for her, I know there's a few questions already. We'd like to hear yours. Put them in the Facebook chat room where Jeff Holman will get that to us. Uh, so I, I guess another topic is, is a lot of people get concerned because they think that, well, I can become a voice actor and I can do big time commercials. But most of the time we hear celebrity voices now most of the time are the clients that that you're working with are are they are they try are they trying to be very media savvy and have these recognizable voices and are all good movie actors or tv actors good for this kind of stuff i i think i'm not sure that that most voiceovers are celebrities but i think what happens is if you've got the money to buy a celebrity to pay for a celebrity you have the money to buy a lot of tv so i think what happens is all of these big brands uh you know let's take car brands i work a lot in the, in, in um, automotive so one does it and most of them feel it's important to do it you know there's cachet to it you're attaching yourself to um you know, someone with some real star power. And there's, you know, there's merit in that. I, I understand that. Um, I think I think a lot of big brands do do that. They like the recognizability. Um, they like the tie-in. I don't think that all <laughs> on-camera celebrity actors make great voiceovers. And I think we all know that. Some of them are you know, it comes really easy for them. And some of them, it's a little bit more of a struggle because they don't have, you know, the benefit of their on-camera presence. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've heard some of them. And it's like, well, I can see why they didn't get cast for this. Uh, it's, it's always right. fascinating, especially when you see the name, but we won't mention any names. No, uh, we won't. <laughs> but some of them can run the whole gamut from A to B. Right. In terms of their directability. Right. And there are some sarcasm. Right. There are some people who are really, really good. I mean, there are some voices yeah. out there. I mean, you know, somebody like John Hamm or, you know, we used to say, uh, 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 what's his name? Sea Hunt. Peter Coyote. Peter Coyote. There's a, there's a good one. You hear his voice or uh, there are just some people that are just really, really good at it. And yeah, but you think that most of the stuff that we're seeing network wise now is it's a wide net of, of, of talented voice actors that you're seeing. I, it, it feels like that to me. I mean, look, this is an anecdotal response. It's not, I'm not, I'm not sitting there tallying up stuff, but I think there are, I think there are two really prominent waves right now um, with the exception of like pharmaceuticals and, and, you know, things like that, um, which are, go for kind of the more tr traditional announcers usually. But I think there are two waves. One is the celebrity wave. And the other is the, we don't want anyone who sounds like an announcer. It's like, you know, um, who sounds like your parents' generation announcer, who's got like the big booming male voice or the female who sounds like she's a perfectly polished announcer. Um, we want someone who sounds conversational and like your best friend giving you advice. You know, we get a lot. I see a lot of that. Um, I see that spec all the time. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And I think, I think part of that is it, you know, there's a younger generation. I mean, newer and younger generation of creatives who don't really want to hear what they grew up hearing all the time. And there's legitimacy to it. You know, that, don't talk at me like an announcer. You're going to get lost in all the other announcers. I think there's a time and place for it. Certainly there are lots of big brands who still employ, you know, whether it's male or female, a more traditional announcer, because that is, that, that is who they are. That's the voice of their brand. But I think there are a lot of brands who want to kind of, they feel like they want to cut through a little and they want to sound a little bit more conversational. Although, who knows in five years that may start to sound like wallpaper to all of us, you know, <laughs> we, we can, we can hope for those of us that came out of radio. Uh, <laughs> anyway, once again, we're talking with Carolyn Casey. 
I, I think something that everybody is probably looking at their computer or their phone or who, however they're watching and thinking, what are some tips to help me get work? Although I think it's probably going to include a lot more don'ts than do's. Yeah. Um, Especially with auditions. Yeah, when it comes to auditions. I mean, I, I wish that I were speaking from a place of, you know, in terms of voiceover talent where I was booking auditions all the time, booking jobs all the time. I, I'm not. I'm really not. I, I think that I'm not an actor. I, I've never taken an acting class. And uh, I will be very honest with my agent, and this is probably tip number one, I will be really honest with my agents. If something comes in and says, we want an actor who has a ton of range and ability to do X, Y, Z, I will often email back my agent and say, you know, I don't want to embarrass myself or you. This isn't really my lane and I don't want to waste your time. And I always get a thank you so much for the honest response. I think that that's probably number one for me. If, if, it's, if you know that you're not right for it, you know, I'm not saying don't ever stretch, but if you know that you're not right for it, maybe just politely decline. Um, I think that's one thing. I, I also think that I have a very specific sort of sound. And I think a lot of the scripts I'm hearing, they probably want someone who sounds, you know, maybe a little bit younger and it's a little more playful or it's a little more conversational or or whatever, but I, but I, I, I feel like I can speak more as an agency producer than I can say, here's the secret to getting booked because unless you have a regular gig, I don't know a lot of voiceovers out there. Maybe I'm being naive about this and I'd love to hear somebody drop it in the chat if I am. But I, I really don't know that many people who say, I, I pay all my bills doing voiceover. I mean, I, it's, it's just a different, ball game now. The good news is that there is a exponentially more work out there with the advent of digital and social media, right? There's that much more content out there. So there's that much more work for all of us and that much more, you know, love to go around. The bad news is because everybody can do it and has a home mic and a, you know, makeshift home studio and can upload auditions, the competition has increased exponentially. So some of the people I know who were making, you know, deep six figures 20 years ago are not, are rarely booking jobs now or not even working that much or competing with people like me who are new in the game. Or they're coaching. And, um, <laughs> which, yeah. Teaching. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah. So going back to your, your question about don'ts, I would say you and I were talking, Dan, a little bit about improvising. My personal take is unless it's indicated on the script to improvise, you know, don't take a lot of license with it. Just be respectful that a writer really, you know, spent a lot of, you know, sweat equity over those, the, those words and probably worked on that script for weeks, if not months. And because it, it gets scrutinized and every word might have been changed and it's gone up through many, many layers of people. So don't assume that you can just improvise. If you're being asked to read as um, an actor and you're supposed to bring something to it and it's humorous or it's uh, an interpretation or it specifically asks for improv actors, then yes, the best thing to do is maybe check with your agent. But if you're reading you know, a voiceover for a car brand, I would say, don't, don't take a lot of license with that. You might, you might just annoy the person on the other end who's listening. Yeah. yeah. Auto, um, auto copy is very, very precise. Well, are, are you ready to take a few questions from our vast audience? That is yeah, worldwide? of course. Okay. We're going to get to those and you still have time to ask yours folks. If uh, you're watching us live, uh, put it in the chat room on Facebook and we'll be back with Carolyn Casey here on voiceover body shop right after these messages. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez, and you're enjoying Dan and George on The Voice of Our Body Shop. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big-voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? This is Virgin Radio. Well, okay, we're not that innocent. 
There's jeans for wearing and there's jeans for working. Dickies, because I ain't here to look pretty. She's a champion of progressive values, a leader for California, and a voice for America. It's smart. It's a phone. It's a smartphone. But it's so much more. It's a, the files are ready. Don't forget to pick up the eggs. What time is hockey practice? Check out this song. It's the end of the road for Rick. It's just you and me, Rick. When hope is lost. The I-8 from BMW. Who said saving the planet couldn't be stylish? Hey, it's J. Michael Collins. Bet you think I'm going to try and sell you a demo now, huh? I think they speak for themselves. But I will give you my email. It's jmichael at jmcvoiceover.com. Now, if Dan will stop waxing his mustache for a minute, we'll get back to the show. You know you want to narrate audiobooks. You know that the ACX Masterclass is the best way to learn how to be profitable and successful at narrating audiobooks. But you may not know that this is registration week for the ACX Masterclass. David H. Lawrence the 17th and Dan O'Day only hold the ACX Masterclass once or twice a year, and this is registration week. And here's one more thing you might not know. If you register before Tuesday night, June 2nd at 9 p.m., they'll pay the first $300 of your tuition fee. Instead of it being $1,995, it's just $1,695. But you have to act fast. Visit acxmasterclass.com. That's acxmasterclass.com for the very best audiobook narration and production training. Just $16.95 if you act before Tuesday at 9 p.m. Pacific. Go to acxmasterclass.com. Hey, it's time to talk about Voice Over Essentials. Dot com. You know, Harlan has some great stuff over at VoiceOver Essentials, like the VO1A microphone. But, you know, if you want to hear your audio as you recorded it, it's best to have a great set of headphones. And Harlan offers the Harlan Hogan Signature Series Voice Optimized Headphones. These are flat response headphones, not for listening to Pink Floyd or whatever you want to listen to. These have a nice flat response that give you what you recorded. Plus, they're incredibly comfortable. You can wear them for a really long time while you're editing an audiobook or some long format narration. It's got leather pads, a really flexible headband, and if you happen to forget you're plugged in, this thing just pops right out and then it pops right back in so you don't blow out another cord. Go over to voiceoveressentials.com for your Harlan Hogan Signature Series Voice Optimized Headphones. VoiceOverEssentials.com. And we're on, I'm assuming. Uh, our guest is Carolyn Casey, and we're talking about the production process. And uh, we got lots of questions from our vast audience, which is worldwide. They're in, having lunch in Australia. They're doing whatever it is they do in Chile. and uh, But they're watching our show, and they want to ask you. So, George, why don't you pick it up and fire away with those? You got it. First one in the queue here is from Craig Ferguson, who's watching obviously live. Um, he says, hi, Carolyn. Are there any common irritations voice actors cause you in a session? Uh, obviously things to avoid doing. Oh, good question, Craig. <laughs> Unless you um, want to be fired. <laughs> you no, know, that's, that's a good question. I, I do find most people to be really professional. I mean, obviously being tardy is a tough one because we're paying a lot of money for that session. So that's a tough one. Um, I would say if there's anything to avoid, and I don't think most people do this, but be sensitive to the fact that the writer giving you feedback has written that script and it's pretty precious to him or her. So if you think something's really clunky and not working, just be sensitive about it and, and maybe say, you know, I'm having a tough time with this phrase. Could I try something else? Um, one thing I do find helpful is if a talent is a little bit proactive about stuff in, in terms of like, hey, do you want me to give you a series of three on those? Or would you like me to try a series of three with completely different reads on that tag? Things like that. Let's see, what's irritating? I, I, I'm not usually, well, I was gonna say, I'm not usually really irritated by voiceover talent. Don't, don't get into to a lot of personal stuff and talk and whatever. Uh, not, not that we don't want you to be personable, but 
it, it's really easy to sort of get off track when you're isolated in the booth and not realize that you've, you're, we're burning away money. So, you know, just, just be there and be aware that, that we want to engage with you, but we also need to kind of move quickly probably onto our mix. I, I hope that answers it, Craig. Sounds pretty straight. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's easy to want to be personable, but overly verbose or taking time. People don't know. Maybe they're just not realizing how much money per hour this production is actually right. costing. So, right. yeah. and, and I guess if you need a break, if you need anything, I need some water. I need a break. Could I walk away? I'm, you know, whatever it is. Totally fine. You're a human being too. We, you know, right. we, we don't want to treat anyone like they're, you know, a commodity. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Fred North, one of our regulars, he says, where are you casting most of your talent? Is it pretty much all agencies or are you guys going to other platforms? It really just depends. Uh, you know, I bop around and I work at a lot of different places. So there might be agencies that prefer a certain casting director who work with the same casting director all the time. Um, they're, sometimes it's the producers got favorites. They've got talent agents they really trust and, and not, not fra favorites. Like we're, we're, you know, we're kind of greasing each other's palm at all. Nobody's doing that. It's just a matter of someone you could trust, you know, that, I mean, I've got an agent I go to all the time. They're my first call here in LA because I don't even want to say how many years ago when I was a baby producer, the founder of that agency was so kind and patient to me. And I said to him, you will always be my first call. And they, and they always have been. Um, you know, I think, I think when, when projects can afford it, they prefer to go through casting directors. But I think if you've got a good agent you trust, there is so much work out there that I think there's enough to spread the wealth, you know, that there are low budget projects that are going to go to, you know, maybe non-union agencies or people who have, you know, more affordable, you know, scale talent or whatever. But I don't know that there's a, a trick. Maybe can we ask him if he has an agent? Does he have an agent? We'll find out. We'll see. Yeah. He, he'll, maybe he'll reply in the chat yeah. again. Not, not that I want to talk specific agents on, on this, but I'm just yeah. saying that, that number one is, and I want to go to the, I, got, I want to go to one of the don'ts for a second. Number one is you need an agent if you're going to be talking to producers who are working on even decent sized brands. So one of the don'ts I have is don't send a voiceover demo directly to an agency producer. Don't sift through LinkedIn and find all the commercial agency producers you can and send your VO demo because chances are good. It's just going to get lost in the shuffle that on any given job, we are going back to the well, whether that be to agents or to casting directors. So you're, I think it's a waste of your time if you're just kind of, you know, blasting out your reel to a bunch of people. It's like, it's like the equivalent of sending your headshot. Like, I'm not gonna cast you directly off a headshot. I'm gonna have a casting session. So unless you have a direct contact at that agency, my advice would be, not to contact them directly and certainly not to follow up with, I would recommend you don't follow up with your agent, the casting director, certainly not the agency producer, but usually that information isn't revealed on an audition because they just don't have the time. Um, I have said to my agent in the past, if you ever want to give me any criticism on an audition, I'm all ears or on anything that I've done, I'm all ears. But I don't ever reach back to my agent and say, hey, how come I didn't get that and who got that? Like, imagine when you're an agent and you've got hundreds or you're a casting director and you've now listened to hundreds of auditions, it's not gonna sit well with that person. So just let it go. You might, I mean, you know, to Dan's point a little bit earlier, you might've lost the job to somebody who just sounded less like the, Ex-wife. Co copywriter's ex-wife, <laughs> right? Like, sometimes that's the reason you're skipped over. Is, oh my God, this woman reminds me of my college roommate. And, you know, yeah. I'm okay with that. If I annoy you because I sound like your college roommate, like move on. Oh, I don't even remember what my college roommate sounded like, but I can sure remember his face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, a couple more quickies. Uh, Debbie Smith says, please describe the steps that happen once a VO talent has been selected 
and then hired. What paperwork should I expect? Uh, uh, It was Debbie. I don't know if Debbie Debbie. is union or non-union. Depends on that. Yeah. So if it's union, there's really standard paperwork. Either it's a, a, a template union contract a side con- or after a contract, whatever it is. Um, or a lot of larger agencies have their own version. It's just kind of their branded version. The language is the same. If it's non-union, get it in writing. I, I think that there are unfortunately a lot of stories where people say they got hired uh, uploading something and doing a final piece and they were never paid. And I'm hearing this from people with a lot of experience. So I'd say, you know, make sure you get whatever in writing, but once you book something, it just, it just really depends if you're non-union on, on who, who the agency is, you'll probably get an email and then, you know, you should ask for paperwork to be signed before the session. So you know what the agreement is, including session and use, you should know what those numbers are. And if you have an agent, that agent should have worked out those numbers already for you. All right. This one comes from Brad Giffen. Can you guys hear my daughter singing to herself in the yeah, background? A little bit, but you know. All right. No, but let's hear it louder. Yeah, it's not unpleasant. What's she singing? I have no idea. She's just <laughs> Cute. passing the time. In Put the her room. on camera. Uh, <laughs> Brad Giffen, or Giffen, I should say. Sorry about that. Um, says, the past 10 weeks, the most sought after voices appear to have been deep and comforting. I wish. I.e. me, he says. <laughs> and me. <laughs> I guess he's booking. Um, now, as America begins to cautiously reopen, have the lighter, more youthful voices started returning to casting? I think so. I mean, I, I only do one job at a time, so I don't know that I can speak to exactly where things are going. I am seeing personally a lot of lighter copy coming through. Yeah. There was um, um, a great piece on, I don't think it was Pod Save America, but one of the crooked media shows where they were kind of did this montage of all of the, you know, in these difficult times, in these trying times. And, you know, they, we're in this together, 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 you know, it was all that. I, I got a million of those scripts. So yeah, I agree. It's been rather somber and more serious and I do think we're heading back into, um, hopefully, into, uh, you know, some of that still. We need to, as brands, be sensitive to it, but but maybe a slightly lighter, more hopeful tone. We can only hope. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Last hopeful. one. Go Here's for it. One more in here. Yeah. Uh, maybe, so we've talked a lot about some of the don'ts and some of the irritation things, but Douglas Voice Guy says, what do you wish voice talent did more often in their auditions, presentation, demo, whatever, like what should be, what do we, what do they need to be putting out there more? You know, I, I don't really have any complaints. I know that's kind of a lame answer, but I think I hear s- such a range of people. I think there's so many talented people out there. And, and I think that there are so many people who just sound great as is. So I say, just keep, just be true to who you are. Um, and, uh, you know, cutesy is never good, but we get that more with on-camera people, a lot of kind of cutesy, you know, sort of, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be memorable and it's not always the truth, but I, I, I think that they're, I think they're good choices out there. And again, I, I, my only real advice is if it's not your lane, just say so. And, um, and that, that might be, that might be a, a good kind of way to go. And show you up know? on time and follow the instructions. Yeah. <laughs> always follow the instructions because it's like, you, yeah, you don't even get the, you know, the labeling system, right? That's amazing how people screw that one up. We've got, I've got I, one, I've got one more topic I want to cover here yeah. before we go to break here. Uh, George and I have been watching these threads of, of the entire production process of where some of these tech specs have been coming from when, uh, you know, the, the agents say, you've got to have this and you've got to have that. And those of us that have been doing this for many years are like, well, you don't need that stuff. Why is this coming through? And this is coming through from clearly from initially from the engineers going to the casting directors and on to the producers and on to the agents. And it's turning into this giant game of telephone where it's getting lost on the other end. And we're wondering where do, you know, the technical specs that are, you know, they're saying you've got to have this type of microphone and you've got to have, have you seen any of that? 
I have not seen a lot of that, Dan. What I'm seeing is that, you know, since we're all, you know, living through this pandemic and recording studios aren't open and businesses aren't, we're not together. We're all, you know, all production projects and posts are being done virtually. Um, I'm, I'm seeing every single script, including the ones that I'm sending out as a producer. Uh, there, it, the, the specs seem to be, you either need Source Connect or ISDN and the equivalent of a home studio. And I, I feel like the agents and brands are leaving it up to the talent to really know if their you know, equipment is up to spec. It is a guessing game. Uh, to be honest, for me, I've turned down a lot of auditions and um, George knows this is why I initially contacted him because I don't have a soundproof home studio in quotes. You know, I've got a situation where I got some bleed from the outside with the dog across the street and things like that. So I don't want to make myself or my agent look foolish by saying, oh, yeah, no problem. Um, and that's just sort of, I think, the reality for a lot of people now. But what I'm seeing more in terms of specs are you must have ISDN, you must have Source Connect and, um, uh, you know, and, and, a, and a good professional mic. But no one is getting that specific with equipment so you might be seeing something different yeah well we've we've been seeing a lot of stuff coming down from agencies and it's scaring a lot of people however it's been great for george's in my business so yeah uh, yeah there's that of yeah, course. which is which is is wonderful and we're teaching people how to do it right well carolyn it has been a pleasure talking to you and wonderful to see the other side of what goes on of this magic portal between talent and everybody else and uh uh, we'd love to have you on again sometime, and but we really would love to do it. We, yeah, we, it was fun. We appreciate you being with us today, and uh, we're not going to tell you how to put people how to contact you because you don't want all those auditions <laughs> and demos. <laughs> anyway, thanks for being with us. It's great talking to you. Can Absolutely, we, thank you. I can't wait till we can meet, not virtually. Anyway, uh, absolutely, and good luck to everybody out there. I know it's a it's a it's a tough time to, uh, right. for everybody, but. We're trying. All righty. Thank you. All right. George and I will be right back to wrap this up into a nice, tight little ball right after this. This is Anthony Mendez. And you're watching Voice Over Body Show. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. And action. Hey, all right. Action. Should I do my commercial? You should. All right. <laughs> cool. 
All right, three, two. Well, it's the time of the show where we do a spot for our beloved sponsors for quite a long time, Source Elements, the creators of Source Connect. And by now, if you haven't heard of these guys, well, then you're not in voiceover because this is they're really the bell of the ball right now in the voiceover business in terms of tools that voice actors need and productions are using. Um, it's basically the software that allows your studio to connect to all the other voiceover producers and engineers of the world and, and be piped into their studio live, real time, but in very high quality, non-wavering, consistent, time-locked audio. That is especially important when working to picture. And a lot of people are now doing that. They're doing animation, ADR, and there's a video component sometimes in the mix. And to do that right, you need Source Connect. So this software you can install in your system and have it up and running within a couple of hours. We've, there's training videos. In fact, if you go to georgev.tech slash SC, um, there's some helpful infor information linked on there, including a video about how to set up Source Connect standard. But you can get that demo set up, get a 15-day free trial, have it all teched out and sorted out. So when the client says, do you have Source Connect? you can say yes, because chances are that's going to be coming up more now than ever. So anyway, thanks again, Source Elements, for your support of our show. We do really appreciate it, and you guys are the best. We can't wait to see what you guys have coming down the pipeline. We'll be right back to wrap it up right after this. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez, and you're enjoying Dan and George on The Voice of Our Body Shop. And we're back. Boy, Carolyn was great. I you you found her and you said she's going to make a great guest, and she was. Yeah, it was. It's rare that I have a client who has her pedigree with all that background in production. You know, vast majority of my clients are voice actors, and or they come from, you know, other world lines of business, or they come from acting, or they come from radio. But that was she was definitely unique. So I'm so glad we had her perspective. I, Class yeah, act all the way too. Absolutely. And I hope everybody got something out of that. All right. Next week on this very show, we'll be doing tech talk number 34, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, we'd love your tech questions. You can always send them to us at the guys at VOBS dot TV. Uh, who are our donors of the week? And we, since we were actually off last week because we did that pre-recorded bit, on the interface, it's uh, there are a lot of a lot of donations in here. It's fantastic. A lot of familiar names: um, Dwayne DeSalvo, Brian Roush, Antland Productions, Michelle Blinker, Christopher Epperson, Philip Sapir, Trey Speaks for You. That's Trey Mosley, Dominic Carlos, Voice Presentations Limited, Mister George Whittem. That's my dad. Patty Gibbons, Stephanie Sutherland, Mike Gordon, Shauna Pennington Baird, Martha Kahn, Don Griffith. And nine four nine de designs, which I happen to know who that one is. Who is that? That's Lee Penny. Well, oh, that's right. Keep forgetting it. Well, that's his new company. He uh, he makes radio control car parts for really high end RC cars. Amazing. Cool, huh? That's absolutely cool. Thanks, Lee. Yeah. All right. Well, we appreciate all those donations. There's a donate now button if you go to our main website, vobs.tv, and click on that and. It helps us keep this thing running week after week, giving you fresh content every week. So we really appreciate all your support. Uh, we'd like you to show us your booths. We've got a few that are coming up. Uh, and we'll, when we get back together, I think we'll start getting George and I back in the same booth. Because uh, it's fun to be in other people's booths. I mean, we do it all the time anyway, but to be sitting on them and doing our show from somebody else's booth is kind of cool. So you can send yep. those send those in in landscape, not portrait, uh, to uh, the guys at VOBS.TV. And uh, you can't be in our studio because you can't go anywhere right now. So anyway. Literally. Liter literally. <laughs> it's like, hey, I'm, I'm alone here. If we could pan the camera in here and you'd see that I'm all alone kind of weird anyway uh we need to thank our sponsors because we couldn't do the show without them like harlan hogan's voiceover essentials voiceover extra Sora elements voheroes.com voiceactorwebsites.com and and jmc demos all righty and the dan and marcy leonard foundation for the betterment of live and recorded webcasting uh jeff holman sort of for uh chat room duty and our technical director 
who's sweating it out there in Burbank, uh, getting it done, going, what on earth are these guys doing? Sue Merlino, we love you, Sue. Thanks for doing all the great. You're our hero. She, she was definitely a hero tonight. Anyway, oh, my gosh. Yes, and Lee Penny for being Lee Penny from 949 Designs. Anyway, that's going to do it for us this week. We're going to re-rack it for Tech Talk. You don't want to miss that either, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but uh, you know something? We're trying our best to get you guys to understand what this business is all about. But as we like to say, if it sounds good. Oh, it is good. There we go. We'll fix that one in post. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. See you in a bit.